post independence india effect of language region caste and religion uh, these uh, issues uh, one common thread is running through these issues is that dust hasn't yet settled on these issues uh, what i am trying to try to say is that controversies are still going on over these issues let me first take up the issue of language the issue of language posed serious problems in the uh, the, the early decades after independence i first outline the main sources of controversy first one is a issue of official language of india what should be the official language of independent india that was a big issue second one was the demands for the linguistic reorganization of the provinces of india which in british india was not conform to uh, linguistic divisions and third one was the status of minority languages uh, within the reorganized states in the pre independence india crucial language issue was the relative status of hindi and urdu and the devanagari and persian arabic scripts another part another point of controversy was the status of english vis-a-vis -vis the vernacular and national language. what should be the uh, position of english language vis-a-vis -vis the vernacular and national language another problematic was a relationship a uh, major regional languages of the country this host of minor languages and how the speakers will would communicate across the linguistic boundaries these were the problematics regarding language that the those those who were uh, in the in charge of the central government constituent assembly faced how they tackled it now i come to that point uh in 1947 there were 11 languages each spoken by a million of people million people gandhi first and then nehru advocated hindustani as official language for independent india dao they advocated the kind of hindustani which was a bit sanitized hindustani however demand was raised for more sanskritized hindustani mostly used in north india to be the quote unquote official language of india this demand was outright rejected by non hindi speaking uh, southern and eastern india uh, in this situation a compromise solution was worked out by the constituent assembly what was the compromise solution hindi will be the official language their first decision was that hindi will be the official language but there will be a cooling time or interim period of 15 years after 15 years hindi will be declared as official language of india uh, and during this interim period english will be the working language of the state the word was used that as working language the provinces are free to use regional languages those regional languages which were enlisted in the eighth schedule of the constitution this was the compromise formula worked out by the uh, constituent assembly but the problem came the problem arose when this these decisions was to be was to be implemented after say after the 15 years or or on the verge of 50 completion of the 15 years year mark by the constituent assembly uh, in 1963 there was official languages act which was passed and uh, hindi is to be the official language according to that act as per the decision of the constituent assembly uh, english was accorded the status of it was a uh, what a a uh, flamboyant term used for english associate additional official language english will be the status of associate additional official language and for the, and that will be for the benefit of the non hindi speaking people uh, violent reactions uh, were, were, there was violent reactions against 
uh, this decision and particularly in South India where riots broke out in 1964 and 65. Under these circumstances, government was forced to amend this act and in 1967, the official languages amendment act was passed. And in this act, what was told, what was uh, decided that for official communication between center and the state, both English and Hindi would be used. Now, English, uh, again English came back to its, almost to its uh, prime place. Uh, second one is that regional languages will be used for administration and public service examinations. In 1946, when the Constituent Assembly met, demands were made for linguistic reorganization of the provinces in 1946 itself, before the uh, before independence. Uh, Congress, which earlier tacitly supported linguistic reorganization in uh, AICC in the representation uh, to the AICC, that I think uh, they have uh, stated about 11 provinces from where their uh, representatives will come to the AICC. Uh, well, they tacitly uh, supported the linguistic reorganization. Now, opposed the demand and, and the reason given was, one must note, it will come, it will, it will come again and again, again and again in the interest of unity of the nation. This was told that in the interest of unity of the nation, there should, should not, shouldn't be any linguistic reorganization of the provinces or states. In 1948, Linguistic Provinces Commission was set up under the chairmanship of S.K. Dar. Despite huge support for the creation of at least four states, Kerala, Andhra, Maharashtra and Karnataka, the Dar Commission rejected the demand for linguistic reorganization of provinces. Again, the excuse, or I won't say excuse, the cause or reason was given the interest of national integration, I quote unquote, national integration. It was for the Congress in the interest of the unity of the nation. Now for the Dar Commission, it is interest of the national integration. In December 1948 itself, Congress forms its very high powered committee to deal with this uh, linguistic uh, division of provinces, uh, reorganization of the provinces issue. Three eminent members of Congress party, Jawaharlal Nehru, Sadar Ballabhai Patel and Pattavi Sitaramaya were the members of this commission. It was called the JVP, JVP, Jawaharlal, Ballabhai and Pattavi. Uh, they gave their report, it's called, it's, uh, it's known as JVP report. Again, they rejected the demand for linguistic reorganization and again, the reason was given, now the term words are different, safeguarding the national unity. Whatever you see, this, they would say, uh, say uh, whatever the language, the main thing was the concern for national unity and for national unity, there will be no reorganization of the uh, uh, states on the, on the language, basis of language. But growing pressure from uh, popular pressure, ultimately center had to give in. And the earliest demand for linguistic province was raised by the Telugu speaking Andhra. The pro protest turned violent when Gandhian leader P. Sitaramalu died after 56 day fast in protest to this uh, or in uh, demanding the uh, state for state of uh, Andhra for the Telugu, uh, Telugu speaking people. The uh, protest became violent and government, central government had to give in and in, on 19 December 1952, the center announced the creation of new state of Andhra. Uh, so this is the beginning of uh, division or, or reorganization of the linguistic uh, reorganization of the uh, states. Uh, first came the Andhra. In 1953, following uh, the birth of Andhra, as a new province or state. 1953, the State's Reorganization Commission was formed. It was also under popular pressure. Uh, the commission half-heartedly, I won't say they fully agreed, but half-heartedly gave, gave in to the demand of linguistic states. 
In 1956, States Reorganization Act created 14 states. However, we must admit that it failed to solve the problems of linguistic minorities. Dissidents' voices were hard, loud, and clear from different corners of India, leading to the growth of quote unquote linguistic sub nationalism. Now we'll discuss the question of our issue of region or regionalism in the Indian context uh, after uh, independence. Uh, theoretically, there are, uh, there are uh, one or two issues which should be uh, um, argued or which should be uh, said uh, at the outset. Uh, the main point is that whether this regionalism is a threat to democracy or a natural outcome of the federal polity. This is the question I think is continuously being asked, still being asked, whether any demand for uh, regionalism or any demand for uh, regional uh, say autonomy or other rights, uh, then this question comes whether it is a detrimental to the democratic democratic uh, ideal, ideals or it's a natural outcome of a federal polity. Uh, I, I, can, I, I will try to give uh, two or three, uh, uh, put some three or two or three points uh, regarding uh, regard regionalism, so not, to, not just not to define it, but as a starting point. Regionalism is a consciousness of and loyalty to a distinct region with more or less homogeneous population. Uh, one should be conscious and loyal to a distinct region where he or she was born and brought up and that geographical space uh, might have uh, more or less homogeneous uh, population, the first thing. Uh, second point is that the development of a political and social system based on one or more such area. Third emphasize on regional, local and characteristics in art, literature, music and etc. This is this cultural traits, I think the main, uh, the, uh, the crux of the regionalism. Uh, now, now I'll come back again to the question whether national identity and regional identity are antithesis to each other. I, 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 I'm going to face this question, whether national identity or regional identity are antithesis. According to me, what I uh, argue that definitely not. National identity and regional identity are not antithesis. Being conscious of uh, one's own regional identity and taking pride in it is not in conflict with one's national identity. This is a clear argument I want to put. Uh, notwithstanding the conflicting interest between different regions of India, According to me, a common cultural trait works as a bonding factor. There are, uh, I, 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 I chose a few factors, a few elements. That is music. Uh, it runs across India. If you folk music of Northeast, South India, Bengal, Maharashtra, it's, uh, it's equally being uh, accepted by all the people, people across India as a tourism. Is one one element which binds the people uh, across India. Uh, cuisines is another thing which also binds uh, people across India. All these are regional traits. All these are regional identity. Handicrafts. All these are regional identities, but they they add a national character also. One must differentiate between secession and regionalism. This is another problematic when you talk about region. We sometime or often train to mix up secession and regional, regionalism. Secession is not regionalism, regionalism is not secession. Obviously, obviously uh, one cannot deny that there are several regional disputes uh, uh, and with occasional hostile outbursts also uh, in India, within India. In the southern states, northeast, or in the north, or in the north India, various issues 
escalated public passion uh, and uh, definitely some of these issues like Kaveri water dispute is yet to be resolved. Uh, but uh, what were the reasons of this regional uh, say in the say the unrest in the region, different regions? Uh, one can point out two points, the economic imbalance among different states and regions is a potential source of trouble. Uh, there is lack of infrastructure, lack of job opportunity, uh, it's creating uh, unrest. Uh, also, uh, another uh, issue which came up just after independence, the son of soil doctrine. Uh, this is still uh, tormenting a uh, few states in India. The idea is that the state belongs to main linguistic groups uh, and in uh, various parts uh, outsiders were also targeted. So uh, in conclusion uh, over the, on, in this topic of region or theme of region I should say that regionalism when promotes one's own own specific identity within a bigger framework of Indian state, Indian uh, national framework is uh, is welcome. It's no, it did do no harm to our national identity. Uh, caste is a long-standing and unresolved issue in independent India. Uh, caste differentiation uh, is an unfortunate but uh, settled fact in Indian uh, society. Uh, even before uh, independence, uh, the national leaders were aware of it. Uh, they were quite aware of it uh, but couldn't do much to tackle it. Dr. B. R. Ambedkar and Gandhiji itself uh, dealt with it. Ambedkar's role for the cause of the uh, Dalits or the civil castes is uh, well known. I won't go into it. Uh, I will concentrate my uh, arguments on two in two parts. First one is the uh, gov central government's uh, efforts to tackle this uh, problem of the Dalits and, uh, and what is the reality uh, of the uh, of reality of the Dalits uh, uh, nowadays. Uh, in the post independence India, government was keen to provide uh, safeguards to uh, Dalits. A special commissioner was appointed for scheduled caste and scheduled tribes according to the constitutional provisions. It started in 1950. Uh, the president of India was given the right to uh, enlist, uh, which uh, enlist the um, schedule, uh, which caste will be uh, included in, in, in it or not. Uh, in post independence India in 1955, uh, this uh, one act was passed and it was uh, again amended in 1976. That is the Civil Rights Act uh, which was passed in 1955 and in uh, 1976 the amended act was called the Untouchability Offenses Act and by the way the untouchability was abolished. Uh, it was a curse on and scar on the Indian society. But the main question is that, the main issue is that whether on ground uh, these, these acts are being implemented or not, or the benefits of this or those acts are passed on to the uh, concerned, uh, concerned persons, this Sidhul uh, caste and Sidhul tribes and other uh, Dalits. Uh, the, uh, the main problem is in the Indian rural societies that uh, th there's a dichotomy between the elite or the dominant caste and the lower caste still passes. This, this bitter fact should be accepted that there is a dichotomy strong dichotomy between the elite and the dominant caste and the uh, lower caste. Uh, the, uh, on the other side, due to mainly uh, what some scholars argued, due to mainly uh, industrialization, uh, in the urban area the caste differentiation, differentiation uh, is, is, is a bit diluted. But if you uh, go into the deep in the middle class and the lower middle class, it, it, uh, it persists in some form or other. I won't uh, elaborate it. Uh, in most villages of India, still now, one or two dominant castes control most of the cultivable lands and other means of production, depriving the Dalits. Uh, in some states, land redistribution might have create, created a better condition for the lower caste people, but that's not 
a scenario across India. Social oppression on the Dalits hasn't yet stopped uh, due to so many uh, acts and IPCs. Uh, this hasn't yet stopped. Uh, and the political parties across the board still considered them as quote unquote vote bank. This is a very unfortunate fact which also should accept. Uh, and there are other, other, other uh, kind of operations also going on in the rural society. There's the, the kind of a cop panchayat which uh, strongly, strongly opposes the intercaste uh, marriage and, with, and uses quite violent means. Uh, backlash from the lower caste people also, this is the other side, also is not a rare phenomenon. In Tamil Nadu, Maharashtra, Kerala, among the other places where after independence the anti brahmin movements were prominent. Still, still those parties, political parties who advocated those movements, uh, at least in Tamil Nadu, they are quite powerful. And caste has a big role to play in these states like uh, Kerala, Karnataka, Tamil Nadu. Uh, and when, when the election comes, uh, this, these equations are being uh, counted and candidates were given like that. Uh, violence and counter-violence rocked the states like Bihar, Haryana, UP, MP, and Gujarat. Uh, uh, finally, a reference should be made. I think this, uh, without this reference, uh, any, any discussion about caste in post-independence India will be incomplete. Uh, made uh, of the, of the, for the implementation of the report of the Mandal Commission in 1990. Mandal Commission was formed by the first Janta government between 1977 and 79, but the subsequent government by Indira Gandhi uh, just sat on the, the recommendations and didn't implement. In 1990, the National Front government under Vishwamath Pratap Singh made the decision to implement this uh, Mandal Commission uh, recommendations. And uh, consequently, 27% of the jobs in public sector enterprises under central government would be reserved for the members of the backward caste. It was a, uh, whether you like it or not, it's a momentous uh, decision. Unprecedented protests were organized against the decision of the government by the upper caste students and, and uh, there were uh, scenes of immolation on the Delhi, in Delhi and other states. Uh, uh, it still remains a controversial issue, the Mandal Commission report uh, recommendations. However, the long-term impact of the Mandal Commission recommendations can't be overlooked. Uh, we know that in independent India was born out of a violent scenario of partition, communal conflict, consequent and consequent human tragedy. Uh, as much as in pre-independence time, in the post-independence uh, in, in still dead, there is an ongoing debate uh, over the role of religion in politics and vice versa. The Congress in its Karachi resolution in 1931 uh, declared that states shall observe neutrality uh, in regard to all religions. Gandhi at the outset himself found there can be a coexistence between religion and politics, but by religion he meant uh, the dharma or a source of uh, morality. Uh, later, in view of growing communal tension in the country, in 1942, Gandhiji uttered his famous words, religion is a personal matter which should have no place in politics. Indian constitution also declares the country as a secular democratic republic. In 1973, Honorable Supreme Court held the secular fabric of the constitution to be the basic features of the constitution. Fundamental rights of the constitution also mandate prohibition of discrimination on the grounds of religion and allow the right, right of, to freedom of religion. Uh, there, is, there is one, just like one significant point I want, I want to uh, discuss and finish off this argument. Uh, that there is, uh, there, nowadays we hear two antagonistic terms, uh, secular and communal. What is secular and what is communal? Uh, I'll finish it up uh, by uh, giving this, uh, by arguing uh, over this. I'll take, I'll, I'll, I'll quote 
Radha Krishnan, yes, Radha Krishnan, Sarvapalli Radha Krishnan, the famous, most erudited persons, one of the most erudited persons of India, former president, he said that secularism, uh, here defined, he was uh, arguing over secularism, uh, defined is in accordance with the ancient religions of the tradition of India. And he added, no person should suffer any form of disability or discrimination because of his religion. This is the main point. No person should be should should be should suffer from any kind of disability or discrimination. That is secularism. Right? And what is communalism? According to me, the communalism is transgressing the space of other contesting religion and suppress it by force and trying to manufacture uh, uniformity. This is uh, my definition of communalism. So, uh, with these words, I close my arguments on religion and close the arguments on, my, on this uh, particular module.